soldier, diplomat, politician, prime minister. Benjamin Netanyahu has been called many things in his life. A life of contrasts and contradictions. A life of power and ambition. But who is the real Netanyahu? What does he stand for? What are his beliefs? What is his story? Let's take a look at the making of this leader, his many avatars, many policies, many controversies, and what awaits him. Hello and welcome. You are watching Gravitas Plus. I am Molly Gampir. This story begins in October 1949, one year after Israel's formation. This is where Netanyahu was born, the second child of a historian. His paternal grandfather was a rabbi and a Zionist writer. His name was Nathan Milikowski. Later in life, he Hebraized his surname from Milikowski to Netanyahu, a name which means God has given. His life was nothing less than a gift. After being initially raised in Jerusalem, his family ended up shifting to the United States. They stayed in Philadelphia for over six years. Here, a young Netanyahu attended the Cheltenham High School. He was set to be active in chess, soccer and debates. But during his time here, he and his brother became dissatisfied with what they considered a superficial way of life. The liberal sensibilities, the reformist ideas and the modernity. So after graduating from high school in 1967, Netanyahu returned to Israel. And upon returning, he enlisted in the Israel Defense Forces and trained as a combat soldier for five years in a special unit. What did this special unit do? Well, it conducted cross-border raids during the War of Attrition. Netanyahu himself was involved in many missions. He was also wounded in combat on multiple occasions. These feats marked the beginning of his life as a team leader. In 1968, he took part in the Israeli raid on Lebanon. In 1972, he was involved in the rescue of the hijacked Sabena Flight 571. During this mission, he was even shot on the shoulder. In 1973, he led his team in the Yom Kippur War. He took part in several raids along the Suez Canal. The same year, he led a commando attack deep inside Syrian territory. The details of the attack remain classified to this day. And three years later, in 1976 came the most defining moment of his life. His brother Jonathan died while leading a raid to rescue hostages from a hijacked plane in Uganda. His death left an indelible mark on a young Netanyahu's psyche. It made him adopt a hard line against all terrorists. He started taking part in counter-terrorist operations, published books on fighting terrorism, gave speeches on combating the menace. He even set up the Jonathan Netanyahu Anti-Terror Institute, an organization named after his brother. Through this institute, he got in touch with several Israeli politicians. This included Moshe Arendt, the then Defense Minister of Israel. He appointed Netanyahu as his deputy chief of mission at the Israeli embassy in Washington, D.C. This was still 1984. From 1984 to 1988, he served as the Israeli ambassador to the United Nations. Interestingly, during this time, he became friends with Fred Trump, the father of future US President Donald Trump. From here, he climbed the ladder pretty quickly. In 1988, he became a member of the Likud party. In 1991, he became the principal spokesperson for Israel. In 1993, he became the leader of the Likud party. And in 1996, he was named the party's PM candidate. Netanyahu won the election. He became the youngest person in the history of the position and the first Israeli prime minister to be born in the state of Israel. He became prime minister again in 2009, once more in 2013, again in 2015, again in 2020, and yet again in 2022. Today, he enjoys the tag of being Israel's longest serving prime minister. He has built a career promising security to Israelis and has emerged as perhaps the most influential leader in the Jewish state's history, only after David Ben Gurion, though. In fact, his dramatic comebacks have earned him the title of King Bibi among his followers. They consider him a man who is politically invincible. 
Yet, for all these impressive credentials, Netanyahu might also go down in history as the leader under whose watch Israel's greatest security crisis unfolded. I'm talking about the October 7 attack by Hamas. It was also the first major ground invasion into Israel since 1948. In Netanyahu's book of governance, it definitely called for a war. Perhaps because many see him as the person who can best keep Israel safe from hostile forces. But 42 days into the war, not everything is going as per plan. Scores of hostages are still with Hamas and anger against Netanyahu is on the rise. The families of the captives are out on the streets. They are demanding Netanyahu's resignation. There is also a global pressure of sorts to make Netanyahu scale down the offensive. Rights bodies are accusing him of facilitating war crimes. Hanging over these accusations is also a cloud of an ongoing criminal trial. Trial for what? For bribery, fraud and breach of trust. These are the charges Netanyahu fiercely denies. To start with, Netanyahu is accused of accepting gifts worth $300,000 from an Australian billionaire and a producer. The gifts allegedly also included jewellery for Netanyahu's wife, Sarah Netanyahu. The second case concerns a quid pro quo arrangement. Netanyahu is accused of favouring the publisher of an Israeli newspaper. He apparently curbed the powers of a rival publisher and in return got favourable coverage. In the third case, Netanyahu is accused of receiving favours from a telecom mogul in return for a promise that he would not harm his business interests. But these are hardly the only controversies. Throughout his life, Netanyahu has been involved in a spiralling saga of legal troubles, scandals that have plagued the leader's three-decade-long political career. In 1997, his government was hit by an influence peddling scandal. He was accused of appointing an attorney general at the behest of a leader facing criminal charges. In 2016, he was criticized after a state expense report revealed that he spent over $600,000 worth of public funds on a six-day personal vacation in New York. This included spending $1,600 on a personal hairdresser. And then in 2019, he was questioned in a probe related to a conflict of interest in a case related to the purchase of German submarines by his friends. Netanyahu was accused of helping his friends secure the deal. So in a way, Netanyahu has always been a man at war. At war with his legal troubles, at war over his personal adventurism, and now he is at war against Israel's most sworn enemy, the Hamas. But has a rage-filled Netanyahu walked into Hamas's trap? By going into Gaza, has Netanyahu triggered a cycle of events that could land him deeper into trouble? To start with, it could weaken overseas support for Israel. Secondly, there is no guarantee that Israel's offensive will succeed. History has shown that every time Israel has tried to weaken Hamas's control on Gaza, it has only ended up getting stronger. Will things turn out differently this time? My point is simple. This is going to be a long and bloody war. A war that could seal Netanyahu's fate for better or for worse. If he succeeds, he's going to face accusations of subjecting Palestinians to torment. If he loses, he will go down in history as the man who failed Israel. It's a catch-22 situation of sorts and Netanyahu seems to have no way out.